one thing that I really want to mention, I hope um, Jeff, Professor Wasserstrom will also address perhaps a little bit today, is how much he is a public intellectual and uh, uh, really speaks not just to the academy, but to the public at large. And from very early on in your career, I mean, you he's been writing for uh, your regular book reviewer for Wall Street Journal, LA Times. Um, you work with LA Review of Books. Um, um, and you, and that's something I've really admired. I think you're one of the early, really China blog people, right? The China Bee, which we all used to read religiously, and um, as and with books like this and eight juxtapositions, a slender penguin book that I highly recommend. I really enjoy. <laughs> and um, you know, I think one thing that's been really wonderful is how you reached out and you know to a larger audience to really talk about demystify, you know, this kind of mysterious, you know, this China, uh, you know. Uh, you know, the exotic China problem that I feel like often exists within mainstream media. And so I think with more people like Professor Wasserstrom, you know, having a voice in the public sphere, it's, you know, it's good for all of us. And so one of the things, you know, we're really delighted to have you here talk about is really, as a scholar, how do you tell stories yeah. to the public? Hey. Um, so but anyway, without further ado, let's welcome Professor Jeff Wasserstrom. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> so since this is an invitation to be autobiographical and to talk about, I'll, I'll be talking a lot about myself, so I'm glad you didn't introduce me too much. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. I love the idea of Story Lab. Um, and Eileen, as um, Professor Chow and I are involved together in the China Channel, the Los Angeles Review of Books, so we've been having uh, collaboration and launching that, which is kind of a successor to China Beat though with a lot of differences too, and much more of a focus on discussions of literature and language. Um, it's also nice having Carlos Rojas here with the, um, one of the things I've been doing to try to um, communicate with broader publics is writing reviews of books, and I've written um, reviews of two of his translations of Yen Lian Ke's novels. So the fact that Yen Lian Ke was here yesterday so to, to listen to him and then to be able to speak is, is just really a perfect kind of thing. You'd think that we planned it this way, but Not we really... Not every day Duke is like this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, it's amazing to, um, to be here for this. And reviewing, I, I thought one of the things I'd say, so when, when I hear stories, the first thing I think of is, is fiction. And I mean, of course, I think that, that storytelling can be nonfiction as well, but there's... there's um, the first kind of referent is short stories and, and fiction of that. And one thing that I don't write is fiction. Um, but I enjoy, I, I, I love to read, I've, I've always read novels and I think it's important to read fiction if you're a historian, if you're any kind of scholar, as well as just in any kind of life to live, to read fiction. Um, but writing reviews of fiction is one way that I can get close to, um, to that kind of literary side. Um, the other thing is I've been looking increasingly in the last, um, the last 15 years or so of ways to bring into nonfiction some of the characteristics that I like in fiction. And so it's taking the, the language very seriously, thinking about pacing, which are the kinds of things that, um, that novelists and short story writers maybe do more of um, than academics who are trained in graduate school to focus on their arguments rather than um, their, their presentation. And um, also thinking about ways of moving as close to fiction as I can without leaving uh, the realm of nonfiction. And the genre that I found most um, agreeable for that is travel writing and things that can have some element of memoir in them. And um, it's interesting that this is something that ebbs and flows. There are some, there are some academic genres that have more or less space for these. Um, history, the discipline I'm in, there are, um, there, there are periods when historians have thought of themselves more as storytellers and periods when we've thought of ourselves more as social scientists or having kind of science envy sometimes. And, and there, there swings back and forth in different directions. And there's been talk periodically about there being a return to narrative in history. Uh, there are also ways in which it never completely went away. And I realize that the people that I've um, 
the historians I've admired most and been drawn to have almost always been um, good storytellers in one way or another, even whether they kind of lead with that in a very obvious way, the way Jonathan Spence does. His books are thought of as story-driven and on the borders between fiction and nonfiction. Um, Death of Woman Wong, the first book of his that I read, ends with, it's all based on, on archival documents, but it ends with a dream that a woman had on the night she died. And there's no way that a historian can ever figure out what somebody dreamed on the night before they died. It's simply impossible. He put, it, he put that part in italics to say, here I am going out on a limb. He had footnotes to that section in which he drew largely on short stories that were published around the same time and in the same place where the woman had lived, and he mixed elements from her life with that, but it was still it was going far out on a limb. So I thought of that as, as one kind of um, you know, storytelling that I admired. I couldn't, you definitely couldn't do that in your dissertation and uh, get accepted, but I thought, you know, someday I want to write a book that has some of those qualities. But I also realized over time that there were totally different kinds of historical works that weren't as kind of obviously um, literary or as obviously veering toward, toward fiction, but were just beautifully written and very attentive to language. Um, E.P. Thompson's The Making of English Working Class, which is one of the great books of labor history, and is remembered by a lot of people because of its arguments, actually includes a lot of poetry um, from, from activism and from, um, and also is just presented in a very kind of evocative set of language. So those are the things I've been um, trying to think about more in, um, in the writing I've been doing. And when I get a chance to, I've been trying to do a little bit more of this in um, the teaching that I've been doing as well. Um, occasionally teaching courses in history uh, undergrad and, and graduate that are in part about how to write about the past as much as trying to figure out what happened in, in the past. So I thought I would um, give a, a flavor of some of these things by, um, by talking about the most recent piece I've written about a, um, a subject that I keep returning to. And the subject I keep returning to is student protest. And to go into a little bit of um, autobiography, it's something that has interested me from the time I was a, a little kid. And the reason was that I grew up in, um, in LA in a family that was, um, the, the, my parents were critics of the Vietnam War and they were involved in the civil rights movement to some extent. So one thing they did with us as family outings was to go to protests. And um, occasionally there would be, this is another recurring theme here, there would be music that we would go to here as well as to march. And there was probably a time when I was you know, six or seven when it was as important that Joan Baez was singing that, as it was what the protest was. So there was a moment and I, I didn't think about it. I mean, I thought about it, but I had no idea it would have anything to do with my um, later career path, where during protests of that time, a crowd would go, um, this was, there was a call and response pattern to protests that actually comes out of um, traditions of black churches, but then was adapted to other kinds of movements besides civil rights movement, where one of the things was you would yell out, what do we want? And the crowd would echo peace, when do we want it now? And there are versions of this that have showed up in other movements like that. So I was, a, I was a kid, about six or seven, at one of these things. And I think they thought, the crowd thought it was kind of cute if a little kid shouted out the, what do we want? And so yeah, I said, what do we want? And, the cr and you know, this crowd responded. It was like, this was, I'm totally not religious, but that was closest to like almost a religious experience. And I've, I just was stuck thinking later when I, when I, you know, I always remember that, but when I was, looking into, when I was becoming a, a scholar working on, um, or a student working on things like protests, it was like, how did people figure out what you did in a large group? None of us had talked about what we were going to do. So why did that, how did we all have this like sense of what was going on? So I became very interested in trying to figure out how people, large groups of people who haven't acted together, figure out how to act together. And it's one of the things that's fascinated me about protest. And how do these things, once I started looking into that, so call and response, so it comes out of um, 
protests related to race, and then it later is about protests related um, to, to war. And then when I was in my um, in college years, late 70s, early 80s, there were some new protests. And sometimes they used some variations on the old slogans and this idea that you marched, the idea that you held sit-ins. There were a whole set of ideas that what people, what people did and just sort of thought it was natural to do. And once I started studying um, China, I, I, I was interested in China for a variety of reasons. One was an opportunity I got to study Chinese at Santa Cruz. They offered Chinese relatively early when not all campuses were. I thought I would have a chance to take a trip to China. So I was very, very early for an American then in the 70, late 70s. So I started learning Chinese. I dropped out of the trip, but I kept learning Chinese. Um, but I wasn't drawn to China because of the exoticness of it or the, the strangeness of it. I was, when I, I was in, interested in travel, I, was, I thought I probably couldn't get a job teaching history. So at least if I knew something about China, if I couldn't get a job teaching, maybe there'd be other, other careers. Um, kind of pragmatic, although at that, in the 80s when I did that, people said, you really should study Japan. That's the booming economy we have to all worry about. Or you should study Russia. That's the big geopolitical country we have to worry about. My wife likes to say, now I get the best, I get the last laugh because China is Japan plus Russia. You know? <laughs> um, but I wasn't interested in it so much the exotic. It was very pragmatic. But I did like Chinese food. And I knew if you studied a place, you had to go eat a lot of the food there. I knew I wanted to go to China at some point. But I also was interested in this question of protest and how how people figure out what to do. And a lot of the work on protests had been done about Western settings, so I thought it would be interesting to try to ask, well, what about China? And then what really interested me about the Chinese case as I went to China and was starting to, to research this in the 80s was that student protests were so important. And that when students protested in the teens, 20s, 30s, and 40s in China, Members of other social groups, workers, and others would join them on the streets. And the movements that began on campuses would become these cross-class um, massive events that, that would make governments quake. And I was, so there I was wondering, like, why was it so different in the United States that when student protests um, would take place, there were traditions of student protests, but members of other social groups might not say, the students are protesting, maybe we should join them. It was tended to go on much, much more different tracks. Ironically, there's a kind of turn now. I, was, I would be thinking of one thing that was very different about uh, the Chinese case was how um, the power of protests by young people in their like teens and early 20s galvanizing and spreading to members of other social groups. In the United States right now, We've just had an example of that kind of thing happening. And I'll talk a little bit more about the, the, the youth protests in the United States um, later. But I'll say that the youth protests that just took place, they were in DC. And I happened to be there for an academic conference. So I got to w watch some of them as a sort of um, research on, in the field kind of thing. Um, but I, it has convinced me that there's one continuity about youth movements around the world, which is Right before they happen, there tend to be people of an older generation who say this generation of students won't ever amount to anything. They're self-involved. They're narcissistic. They aren't like we used to be. And this happened in China in 1986. I arrived in the summer of 1986. And I told people when I arrived that I was studying the history of student movements, like the great May 4th movement of 1919 and other movements. And I was really interested. And people said, oh, that's a really good topic. It's too bad nothing like that will happen <laughs> while you're here because the students these days, they all want to just perm their hair, figure out what music people are listening to in the West. They really, they really don't care about politics. And then within a few months, there were students protesting. And then after I went back to the US a couple of years later, of course, there were the big Tiananmen protests that were crushed by the June 4th massacre. So wrong about that generation of Chinese youth. In the early 21st century, I went to um, Hong Kong um, a fair amount, and people said, oh, these Hong Kong students, they aren't very political. I've given, you, know, you, you obviously won't see things like this, like that here. But within a few years, there again, the same generation of supposedly inward-looking youth, that generation was taking part 
in 2012 in the protests against national education, and then especially 2014 in the umbrella movement. So <coughs> there tends to be this pattern of underestimating youth. And just before the, the recent um, anti-gun violence protests, if you asked people in America, what is this generation like? You'd have a lot of people, they all spend all their time looking at their smartphones and um, doing other kinds of shallow pursuits. Not, and we've been proven wrong again. So I've been interested in student movements and youth protest um, for a long time. And it occasionally intersects with my life. I happened to be in China in 1986 when there were these sort of warm-up protests uh, for Tiananmen. I wasn't in China for Tiananmen. Um, life comes along and alters your research projects um, in differing ways. I was tempted to get on a plane, but we just had our first child. And when you've just had a baby, it's not really the best time to fly off to another part of the world. You don't want to miss things. Um, so I didn't go during the Tiananmen protests. But I feel like if I keep writing about it and talking about it long enough, everybody will assume that I was there. Um, I did, though, I, I, my dissertation was about student movements pre-1949, pre and I filed the dissertation in April of 1989, right as the protests were starting. And I ended the dissertation by saying, in effect, there are student movements since 1949, but they either were very different, the Cultural Revolution was very different because they were, I, they were celebrating somebody in power rather than challenging, and there have been some new protests now, and they're very interesting and all, but they won't amount to as great a kind of m massive thing as the great May 4th move, things you were reading about in earlier chapters. So I filed my dissertation, was completely proved wrong by the movement continuing to grow. So I wrote the first book very quickly so no one would read my dissertation. <laughs> And so I could have an epilogue chapter <laughs> talking about the rebirth of the May 4th tradition in China in the 1980s. So the first things that I wrote about um, recent pro about protests as they were taking place was in a very academic format, was in um, my um, dissertation-based book, Student Protests in 20th Century China, The View from Shanghai, um, in which the final chapter was an epilogue that looked back at parallels and continuities with that earlier protest and had a set of arguments. It was an argument-driven book. It was about how students figured out how to behave together collectively, repertoires of action that would develop, the symbolism of their um, propaganda or their um, promotion of their movement, um, things about their tactics, things about their social organization. It was in pretty much more of a um, social scientific kind of historical mode than a storytelling mode. And then I've returned to, um, I've returned to the theme of protest in other places. In um, China in the 21st century, what everyone needs to know, the um, first edition of it came out in 2010, and there was a lot about the Tiananmen um, movement and memory of it. There were also, even though it's about the 21st century, the book has a lot about things before the 21st century, the idea that you need to be able to understand the past, to understand uh, what's happening in the present. So it goes back to Confucius, who was Confucius, what he believed, was he always admired, when was he criticized. The May 4th movement, it has a little bit about that. It has um, things about Tiananmen. Um, in the new edition, the second edition came out in 2013, and it was revised just a little. The new edition, um, co-authored with, with Mara Cunningham, like the second edition was, um, we had to bring in all sorts of things that happened since 2013, and one of the main things we brought in was the Umbrella Movement. In this book, it's also not a story-driven book, in a sense. It's trying, though, unlike, unlike my first book, which was really for other academics, this one is aimed at ordinary people, readers. It's the kind of book we like to say that people can read on their first trip to China, and they can read it from cover to cover on the plane and watch a movie. And we, we try to get information across. And we try to dispel some misunderstandings. So the focus is still not on storytelling. It's more on um, correcting information and giving people a way to think about things. And with Tiananmen, we try to correct a lot of um, misunderstandings. As we, we criticize the Chinese government's um, big lie about it claiming that there wasn't a, a massacre, 
Um, but we also try to clean up some of the misconceptions that um, Westerners have about the movement, which has largely been in memory. The movement has largely been reduced to an image of a man standing in front of a tank and an image of students being killed in Tiananmen Square, when in fact most or all people were killed near the square but not in the square, and many of them were not students. A lot of them were members or were ordinary um, Beijingers. We don't know exact figures, but um, probably significantly fewer than half of the people killed were students, even though the memory of them um, loom, loom largest. So um, then for occasionally moves into storytelling, just another part of um, in, the, in the 1990s and beyond, after my first book was out, um, and even more so after I got tenure, I started feeling freer and wanting to do a different kind of writing that was um, aimed at engaging um, people who weren't in the academy and, I, and sometimes trying to write in a very kind of factual way of correcting misunderstandings and things, but also sometimes trying to experiment with some first person. And so one of the first person pieces I did um, was I happened to be in China in 1999 when there were anti-NATO protests after um, NATO bombs hit the Chinese embassy in Belgrade, killing three, um, three Chinese citizens. And there were um, nationalistic protests that I was convinced were both genuine sentiments of students who were angry at their fellow, com their compatriots being, being killed in, a, um, in an embassy, but also supported by or allowed to happen by the government, which tried to leap ahead and guide the, um, guide the, the course of them. But I wrote a piece when I got back on the kind of um, effort to talk about what it was like to be there, to be someplace where something like what you've studied is happening, and to be there and have the experience not always jibe with what was being reported in the press. And also things that were left out of the story I thought all along, including the fact that I was in Beijing for a few days of protest, then I was in Shanghai for a few days of protest, and the, pro the protests were very different and the moods were very different in the two places. In Beijing, it was closer to the time and there was also a more intensity to the, the protests. And I had this moment when somebody said to a group, there were a few of us who were um, from the West who happened to be there for a conference about the May 4th movement. So we were at a conference about the history of student protests at the time a new protest happened. Uh, but in Beijing, there was a much more intense feel to it. And when I got to, sh and I pretended I wasn't American. I said, I was first learned how to say, so I'm from Canada. And then somebody pointed out, I didn't really know my politics well. Canada is part of NATO. <laughs> so I had to relearn because Australia was okay. Um, but then when I got to Shanghai, I thought, I felt like more, more relaxed. I spent, I spent more time. People didn't seem as, as intense about this. So I just started saying I was American. And I mentioned that when I was in Beijing, I pretended I wasn't American. And some of the Shanghainese said, yeah, in Beijing, they're like, they're like really too intense about everything. And they, they immediately, this was during a, a patriotic nationalist movement, and they immediately started dissing people from the other city, which I thought was so natural, but was so left out of a lot of the coverage in the Western media was these drone-like Chinese youth who are all saying what, exactly what the government says and are all totally nationalistic. I said, no, they're actually more complicated than that, that they're doing this out of their own sentiments. And also, I felt sure if I'd gone from Shanghai to Beijing, and I said, oh, I feel a little more nervous in Beijing, some people said, yeah, well, in Shanghai, they really don't care about stuff. <laughs> and so you know, even in the heart of this movement, in terms of de, uh, getting out of the stereotypes of, of exotic China, one of the stereotypes is that, obviously, is a stereotype that all Chinese are alike, when if you spend time in different parts of China, you realize very differently that even when people are very nationalistic or very patriotic, they're also very intensely proud of their region and their place and their locale. And that's human nature, and it's also part of you know, cultural differences, foods different, dialects different, all that. But that was something I thought was missing in the um, thing. So I wrote about that, and I had dreams of pulling together. Uh, I thought this was maybe a breakthrough piece. I sent it to Rolling Stone magazine, who rejected it. But um, I, I published it in, in, in a book, a collection of pieces. But it had that first person in it, which 
I had a lot of first person, whereas even what I talked about, like why I got interested in student protests in the first place, that wasn't in my dissertation. Because in a dissertation, when you say I, it's supposed to only be in the introduction, and it's more about um, my goal in this, uh, this piece of writing is to do X and Y, or the scholars who have influenced me most are this. So moving toward bringing first person in. So I'm going to, without um, further ado, read a little bit of a section. So H juxtapositions uh, was this little collection of quirky little comparisons, odd comparisons of two places or two, two events or two people. And I wrote some of these. These were some of the more playful pieces I wrote. You can go ahead, kind of arguments. Some of them are first person, and they were brought together into this little booklet. And um, it's done OK. So they're going to put out a new edition. And um, they said, so would I want to write something new for it? And I'll read you part of what I'm writing, which you know is not really going to be called um, the ninth juxtaposition, but it's kind of like that. Um, and I think it'll explain, you'll get enough from it, uh, I'll just read part of it, to get a feel for, um, for what drives me. But the one thing I'll mention is, I've already mentioned um, music several times. And music is very um, an important background to, to me because before I wrote anything else, I wrote songs. So, and I kind of imagined possibly of either going to graduate school or going to Nashville to try to sell songs. And, chose graduate school, but that's in the kind of back of my mind. So with that in mind, I title it, for now at least, Hong Kong, a bonus track. So when you put out a CD, you get to, if you get to reissue it, you can slip in another song that you've written more lately, or you've written more, more recently, or that didn't fit in the first one. So all right, here goes. In September of 2017, the 56-year-old history professor was taking photographs on a Hong Kong campus when he suddenly had a sense that he was repeating an action he had taken long ago and was doing it for the same reason. What exactly triggered this deja vu-like sensation? Two things. First, he kept seeing the, two the, two, the compound term that means democracy, made up of the characters Min and Ju, Min for people, Ju for rule, showing up in his viewfinder as he took shots of posters that students had put up to express their concern about the local political situation. Second, he was taking the photographs to preserve a record of the protest statements, which he thought would soon be removed or papered over by officially approved materials. He knew that back in December of 1986, when he had been an almost 26-year-old graduate student working on a dissertation about Shanghai protests, he had taken shots of posters on local campuses. He knew that he had done this to document the contents of bulletin boards that just a few days, early, few days later would be stripped clear of protest materials. The one thing he wasn't positive about was whether he had seen those exact characters for democracy through his viewfinder back then. It seemed likely he would have, as calls from Word Binju were, part, were central to the, the protest wave of 1986-87, just as they would be to the more famous Tiananmen struggle still to come. Still, his mind might have been playing a trick on him, filling in a retrospective detail that would make past and present line up perfectly. Fortunately, he was able to fact check his memory as soon as he got back to California. He flipped through his first book to its final photo spread, and sure enough, there was a 1986 shot with the characters in question clearly displayed. In November of 2014, the same man had experienced a different sort of Shanghai flashback while tracking Hong Kong protests. He was walking along a freeway that protesters had transformed into a tent-filled car-free zone when they began camping out on the streets of Central saying they would stay there until the authorities acceded to their demands. The historian was excited to be getting his first glimpse of the protests, which he had flown across the Pacific to witness firsthand. Initially called Occupy Central with Peace and Love, it had soon become better known as the Umbrella Movement, in honor of the devices so ubiquitous in rainy Hong Kong, which demonstrators took to shield their faces from the pepper spray and tear gas that the police used to try to disperse crowds. What sent his mind back to Shanghai in his graduate school days then was passing by an ersat study area that students had put up in the Occupy Zone, complete with desks that youths could use to keep up with their coursework while taking part in the struggle. Nothing like these had been constructed during the 1986 protest wave, but the overall orderliness of the 2014 protest site and the spirit behind the creation of the study area in particular reminded him of things he had come across in the archives then about Shanghai struggles of the early 20th century.
during which, as he put it in his first book, which was based on his dissertation and published in 1991, quote, students felt a great need to show that they were not motivated by frivolous concerns, such as a wish to avoid schoolwork. He had never met a participant in the May 4th movement of 1919, during which some students adhered to a highly disciplined hour-by-hour -hour regimen that included an hour set aside for self-cultivation. Walking on the Sh Hong Kong blacktop that had been turned into a communal, a communal protest space in 2014, though, he felt as if he was encountering their doppelgangers. Great, I've always wanted to do a bonus track. These were the first words that popped into my head last August when I got very welcome word from my editor at Penguin that the first print run of H. Juxtaposition was nearly sold out. This presented an opportunity, she said, to add some new material so the press could bring out an expanded second edition rather than just do a second printing of the original. Did I want to do this? I told her, of course, and set out on a circuitous writing journey that led, after a couple of detours and false starts, to crafting the vignette above what I've just read which is put in all italics, like the Jonathan Spence thing of going into a, um, a varied things. Um, so the vignette above, which is based on my own experiences and the set of further comments on parallels between Shanghai's past and Hong Kong's present that will close this chapter. Before saying more about this subject, though, a word is in order about why I thought bonus track when my editor contacted me, and then about the two demos I started recording, but then abandoned before coming up with a Hong Kong Shanghai cut I liked. So I go on to more about this uh, thing, but that's the kind of way of leading in. And then I do another kind of playful thing at the end. I talk about a couple of the roads not taken, other ways that I thought about bringing Hong Kong into the story. And I talk about what, um, what I almost did as a comparative chapter as opposed to this before I did. And so that too, even this kind of being self-conscious about the process and talking about roads not taken, is a whole nother way. And I'll just mention, because I had, had fun with this, and I, I kind of wish I had been able to turn it into an actual whole chapter instead. I talked about, because the book is all about kind of quirky comparisons, and one of the comparisons I've always thought in my mind about Hong Kong is that Hong Kong, when I first went there in 1987, again, first person, I took a train from Shanghai, or no, I, I went from Shanghai around other parts of the mainland and then went to Hong Kong. And in 1987, Shanghai, it's hard to believe if you are from Shanghai or you've been there lately, Shanghai was the most boring city I had ever lived in. There was just nothing to do. It was fascinating. It was fascinating to be in China during that period. I think it was a pretty golden period, uh, post-Mao, pre-consumerism. It was a moment of where many people had roughly similar wealth and um, were living in roughly similar material conditions. It was one in which... Um, my wife talked about it, but the first time place she lived where there weren't billboards objectifying women's bodies, uh, when she felt safe riding her bike around alone as a woman at midnight in a, in a great city. So there were many things, but it was also boring. Hong Kong, on the other hand, was really exciting. Shanghai, there was only one Hollywood movie that played there the whole year, first year I was living there, and it was Superman, which I'd already seen. So it was really, really dull. Uh, Hong Kong, on the other hand, there were you know movie theaters, department stores, restaurants, all kinds. Of, Shanghai had about five restaurants. You know, anyway, it's just unimaginable. Um, but going from the Chinese mainland to Hong Kong, at that point, felt like I'd never been to Hong Kong before. But it felt like coming home. It felt like coming back to the sort of consumerist cities I, I was used to, and I'd been to in Europe and in America, and that, and cities of excitement. Then um, went back to Shanghai for a while and then took the Trans-Siberian Railway and went to um, across Russia and ended up in Berlin. And getting to West Berlin after having spent time in mainland China and then going through Communist Party run parts of the world, coming to Berlin was suddenly going back from kind of drab uh, cities to exciting ones. So I always thought of West Berlin and Hong Kong as kind of parallel spaces during um, the Cold War. This is how this juxtaposition thing works. They were places that were small outposts of a certain kind of um, capitalist modernity right by a big continent-sized um, Communist Party-run state. And it was, uh, there were, once I started thinking about that, there were some other parallels too. John le Carre is famous for writing 
um, spy novels set in West Berlin where spies go check out uh, the Eastern Bloc by going across the wall um, to East Berlin. Uh, Lakari wrote one book set in Asia that I know of, and it's set in Hong Kong largely, Honorable Schoolboy, and spies in Hong Kong were trying to, using it as a listening post of what was going on in uh, communists out there. So anyway, so I've thought a lot about that as a comparison. The thing I almost did was try to write um, a comparison of Berlin and that. So what happened though, after both of these places, West Berlin and East Berlin and East Germany are all part of one country now, but the style in which it's governed is much more West Berlin style spreading over everywhere else. Hong Kong in some ways, it's been more like as though East Berlin subsumed uh, West Berlin, that Hong Kong has been absorbed into, um, into the mainland, though of course there are ways in which it's still different. And the struggle, the umbrella movement was largely to struggle to pre preserve the things that make Hong Kong very different. So I've thought of it, but I didn't quite, this is where maybe, you know, if I had a little bit more of the fictionalizing gene, I might have gone even further. Now I just talk about how I almost did it. There's this, um, there's this movie, this wonderful movie um, called Goodbye Lenin that's about a East Berlin family that the mother, I'm trying to remember, the mother kind of goes into a coma right when the wall is falling down and East Berlin is being absorbed into, um, uh, into, West, into West Germany. And when she wakes up, they say they, she's not supposed to have any excitement. She's not supposed to have anything. So her children, good filial children, try to fool her into thinking that the East Berlin system is still in place. Tries to hide all signs of advertisements for Coca-Cola or McDonald's. Tries to, they do, they do little uh, mock-ups of the propaganda news program so that she won't hear the news. She can turn on the TV and it'll show a tape that they've made. It's really, it's really a clever, beautiful um, movie. So I was trying to imagine what would be like if somebody like Rip Van Winkle like fell asleep in uh, Hong Kong before 1997 and woke up now. How would you fool them into thinking that Hong Kong hadn't become part of the People's Republic of China? What would you have to do to make them think that Hong Kong was still, but anyway. So instead of goodbye Lenin, I call it hello Mao. Um, <laughs> but I couldn't quite um, put it all through. So I just mention it as a, another kind of trick device to say like, that's what I almost wrote. And then you don't have to do the messiness of actually creating a work of fiction that I really admire people who can do that well. So I have some um, images. I'll just, I, I won't show them all good, unless things come up that Jim, but um, one of the things about when I talked about that, um, it's like a sense of deja vu when I go to Hong Kong. The other thing I realize is that things have swapped places with Hong Kong and Shanghai. Like when I was in um, Shanghai in the 1980s, I would expect to see protests on campus. When I went to a Hong Kong campus, I wouldn't expect to see protests. Now when I go to Shanghai, I don't expect to see protests on campus. When I go to Hong Kong, I do express, expect to see protests on campus. Um, on the other hand though, some things that I used to like know I'd see in Hong Kong, I now routinely see in Shanghai. I used to think that if I went to Hong Kong, I'd be in an exciting city with lots of department stores and um, restaurants and a, a dizzying array of choices. And now I feel that when I go to Shanghai, even more in some ways, uh, in, some, in some regards than in, in Hong Kong. When I went to Hong Kong, you know, things seemed to move faster than Shanghai. Now when I go to Shanghai, things move faster. So this reversal of places, um, you live long enough and your, your own experiences start to be history. You can draw on. But one example, whenever I go to Hong Kong, I look to see if the goddess of democracy is still there. This is a symbol of the Tiananmen protests that you can't see anywhere on the mainland, but you can see in Hong Kong. And look to see what it's like. And the last time I was there, it had a new skirt on. And this has the names of um, political prisoners, uh, Hong Kong's first political prisoners, according to some people, written on there. Joshua Wong and others um, are written there. So it's one of the things I go back to, um, to look at, uh, you know, I look at see if it's there. Um, and it's one of the reminders that Hong Kong is still significantly different from other parts of the PRC because you can have something like that. Thank you so much. Um...